Thank you for the uh, introduction. So, as you said, my name is Chris Montgomery. Today I'm going to be talking about um, applying this uh, atomic force microscopy IR technique to uh, my material system, which is a carbon fiber epoxy composite. Um, just a brief outline. I'll, I'll start by going over what I mean when I say composite materials, and then um, kind of motivate my talk with the concept of this interface, uh, why we care about it. And then from there, I'll introduce the technique that I'm using, uh, where are the components, how does it work, and then uh, go over a couple of the results that I found in this project. So um, when I say uh, composite material, what I'm talking about are you know carbon fiber composites, glass fiber composites. These are the materials that have very high mechanical properties when you consider how lightweight they are. For that reason, they're used a lot in um, the, the aerospace industry, also automotive industry, um, maritime, um, and even sporting goods. That's where you commonly see these materials. And a uh, composite material um, uh, consists of two or more components. So in my case, I have a reinforcing carbon fiber. And surrounding it, I have an epoxy matrix that helps distribute the load to the reinforcing carbon fibers. So those are the two components. I'd also like to point out at this time that the epoxy matrix itself is also a multi-component system. It's something that you mix together and the two components uh, will cure into your matrix. And uh, this is just a cross-section of a typical carbon fiber composite. So what you'll see here is that um, the, there's a fiber volume fraction. There's about 60% of the materials in these fibers and around 40% is this matrix material that's distributing the load. So um, we really want to understand the behavior of these materials. And the uh, question is, is it OK to look at the fiber and look at the matrix as independent constituents and measure those properties um, independently from each other and then uh, come up with models that, that describe the material um, in that way? And um, what I'd like to point out is that uh, composite materials aren't just a mixture of the two components, uh, very important aspect of composite materials is the interaction between those two components. So uh, depending on the, the interface of your material, you can have uh, different things happen. You can have fibers pulling out of the matrix, or uh, if a crack propagates, it might crack directly through the fiber, depending on the interaction between the fiber and the matrix material. And um, this idea of the interface isn't a new one. It's been around for, for quite a long time. And uh, the notion is, um, when you have your matrix material and you're curing it near a carbon fiber surface, as you saw on the previous slide, there are a lot of carbon fibers. When you're curing it near this carbon fiber surface, you can, uh, the components of the epoxy can, can develop a gradient um, around the carbon fiber surface due to the functionality there. And so what you end up with is actually a region around the fiber that is chemically distinct from um, the bulk matrix region or what you would measure independently from the rest of it. And um, if we want to investigate uh, you know, chemical changes in epoxies, almost as an example, what we can do is we can look at a traditional FTIR uh, mapping, and we can actually track the chemical reaction that's happening. So on the left-hand side here, I have the high wave number region. Right-hand side, I have the low wave number region. I'm just going to blow up this section of the low wave number region so we can look at the actual chemical reaction. Um, that I've detailed here. And so what we see is, um, from a very broad uh, point of view, is that throughout the course of the reaction, so going from uh, t equals 0 to t equals 24 hours, uh, what we see is that the amine uh, components on the left-hand side of the reaction uh, get consumed, and um, we develop more of these hydroxyl groups. Similarly, in the low wave number region, what we see here is that the epoxide here gets consumed in the reaction, and we see a growth in this uh, carbon oxygen um, peak. So this is all fine and good. However, um, uh, one of the problems that we immediately run into is uh, if we're wanting to study the interphase, and this is a quote that, that came from 1985, uh, an in-situ probe that can interrogate the interface and provide spatial, chemical, and morphological information does not exist. So um, as I mentioned earlier, the interface is something that, that we've been really interested in for quite a long time, but the techniques to study it just haven't really been there. Um, but this, this quote came from about three decades ago. And um, thankfully, since then, some, some new techniques have, have come about in uh, high-resolution spectroscopy. 
uh, particularly in wanting to study um, you know, biological cells, for example, um, with spectroscopy techniques. All of these techniques have been developed to drive that, um, the spatial resolution up. And so um, what I'm doing for this project, basically, is I'm borrowing one of those techniques that's been developed in the biological field and applying it to my carbon fiber epoxy composites. And so this is the uh, technique that I'll be um, using for these measurements. This is uh, an atomic force microscope combined with um, infrared spectroscopy. So it's set up uh, just like a conventional AFM technique where you have your um, AFM with AFM cantilever with your uh, probe uh, right next to the surface of your sample. And you can track the deflection of the cantilever with the, the laser, just like you would a traditional AFM technique. In addition to that, though, you also have this pulse tunable IR source so, um, that, that shines on a spot around the, the fiber um, probe. So this, this uh, tunable IR source is a very specific wavelength that you can tune across um, any, any number of, of wave numbers. And so if your sample absorbs, absorbs that particular wave number, there will be a rapid, uh, rapid thermal expansion in your sample. The AFM probe will deflect, and you'll be able to detect that with the uh, photodiode. Um, if, if the sample doesn't absorb that wave number, then you will get no signal. So um, there's two kinds of measurements that this uh, technique can do. One, you can maintain a constant wave number and follow your AFM probe as you raster across the surface, and that will give you a sort of chemical map or, or what the what the response is to that specific wave number in a region of your sample. Alternatively, you can keep the AFM probe in the same location of your sample and modulate the IR source, and you can generate an IR spectra um, using this technique. So those are the two um, sort of approaches that you can do here. So um, this is a uh, representative spectra of the, um, from the AFM IR technique on a bulk epoxy uh, system. What we can see here, compared to a traditional FTIR measurement, is that the wave numbers are in very good agreement. However, the amplitudes of the peaks do change, and that's, that's expected because it is a fundamentally different way of measuring the IR absorption. In one case, you're, you're measuring the light that comes out the other side. In the other, you're measuring some uh, thermal expansion from the sample. So they are quite different techniques. but. We have very good agreement in the peak locations, and we can associate uh, the peaks that we find in traditional FTIR with um, associate them with the same functional groups that we see in the AFMIR. And so, uh, the next step, obviously, is um, that we want to look at uh, how the spectra changes in this region close to the fiber. So here, I've taken a, a four by four micron. Um, scan of the AFM scan of the sample, and we're interested in what the spectra does in this region. So uh, what we see here is as we approach the fiber surface, we do see a decrease in the overall signal um, as, as we go and approach the surface. And what we've seen in, in, uh, in a related study is that this is, this is due to the change in um, height near the surface. Um, it turns out it's quite difficult to get up perfectly flat uh, composite sample because they want to be removed at different rates. So there is a decrease in the overall signal. However, um, we do know that we can normalize this signal and we expect the ratio of these uh, different peaks to remain the same um, for, for a given spectra. And so if we look at this uh, carbon oxygen peak here that corresponds to the cross-linking product, and we normalize by a couple of reference peaks. What we see is, uh, relative to the other peaks, we do get this increase in the carbon-oxygen product um, compared to, to uh, non-interacting um, carbon-oxygen stretches. And then for the, the other type of measurement that, that's been done here is the, um, the chemical mapping. So that one, we, we actually looked up the high wave number region. And that's what we see here. So in the left-hand plot here is uh, um, I've, made, I've prepared a few samples that all have different known stoichiometries in them. I've uh, collected a chemical, uh, chemical spectra for each of those. And what we see is that in, in a mean-rich um, epoxy system, so that one where you have more of the, the hardener component of your epoxy, 
we get uh, hydroxyl peak broadening um, in the spectra. And so if we take a ratio of the, the hydroxyl peak to some point on the side of the hydroxyl peak to characterize this, uh, the broadening of the hydroxyl peak, uh, and we convert that into a map, so this is a, a ratio of two chemical maps, what we see is an increase in the um, amine rich, um, uh, what, what, what can be attributed to an increase in um, an amine rich region near the fiber surface. So um, just to summarize, uh, in order to study these interfaces and composite materials, we need uh, high resolution uh, spectroscopy techniques. And um, the, the technique that we've chosen has very good agreement in terms of the, the spectrum um, that is measured between that and traditional FTIR. And then um, finally, the, the preliminary results for the IR response near the, the carbon fiber surface um, suggests that we might have an amine-rich region uh, near the surface, which is in agreement with um, some of the, the literature that's out there with regards to what, what should be attracted to the surface. With that, I'd like to uh, thank the, the AMS group for their feedback, um, Scott Robinson for, for um, all the help in sample preparation and uh, SEM work, and then uh, out of the Air Force Research Labs, uh, Judy Naipaul and Josh Kennedy are um, my two collaborator collaborators there that I uh, work with on this technique. Thank you.